I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 1st of May, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And a lot of people have been asking me over the last few days or about a week about health insurance and how they handle that or should handle that when coming to Nicaragua. So that's what we're going to be covering today, right after the bump. Okay, today I just want to point out, it is the middle of the day. This is a huge thunderstorm rolling in and the rain has just started. So I'm gonna to have to move at some point, but the light was so fantastic and I'm out in the storm. I love storms, which is perfect for those of us who live in Nicaragua because for six months of the year, we get some pretty incredible storms. This is Central America and storms that are really exciting and really regular are part of the landscape. So we get to enjoy, for those of us who are storm freaks and rain lovers, this place is pretty fantastic. So today's one of those days I don't want to be indoors. I want to be hanging out outside, but I did need to get an episode done. So I bet you can hear some of this rolling thunder in the background. It is seriously loud here. The dogs are freaking out, uh, but I wanted to do it outside. So that's why I'm here doing my best. It is raining on me, but just a little bit at the moment. So. Fingers crossed that that's how it's going to work. So health insurance, when you're moving to Nicaragua or anywhere, health insurance or how you're going to handle medical care is very important to consider, obviously. And it's something that people often overlook until they start to panic about it and then it becomes something they're scared of. So I want to talk about this a bit because it really is a point that should be considered for sure, but it's also a point that should make you feel really comfortable with your move to Nicaragua. But why should you feel that way and how do you approach it? Those are the things we really have to know. So first of all, we assume a bit of my audience is coming from the US and Canada or even England. All of these places have something in common, which is they are famous throughout the world for being some of the most expensive and horrific healthcare you can find anywhere. Of course, they are very different from each other. They love to point out how the others are worse than they are. The reality is, is that the US is famously terrible healthcare at high prices. Canada is moderately good healthcare with terrible wait times, so you're not always able to get that healthcare. And, the, and England is just collapsing. All of them are hugely problematic when it comes to healthcare. And because of that, the citizens of those countries have a tendency to see healthcare as a much scarier, more expensive, problematic, and insurance requiring activity than it is to people from other countries. If you're coming from traditional Western Europe, the France's, the Spain's, the Germany's, the Italy's, you're going to see healthcare as something that you just expect to be taken care of and it's generally cheap and excellent and you probably aren't going to worry about it when traveling abroad so much. But everyone needs to be aware of what is available and how to work with it. One of the biggest questions that comes up, of course, is what to do about insurance. Do you need it? How do you get it? What do you do? So for many people, if you're simply going to be here as a tourist, you need to consider what you have to have in your home country. For most people, that means you need to have insurance in, say, the U.S. or Canada or whatever. Whether it's national insurance or private, you need to have coverage in your home country because that's officially where you're resident and it probably is required one way or another, either because you're going to be living there part of the time and you can't give it up, or it's required by your government or you pay it in your tax or whatever. And in some cases, it's simply included. So if it's free, certainly keep it. Our kids keep it Texas insurance because Texas pays for that insurance because of the age of my kids and because of our income. They simply uh, make it completely free for us for the children, which is absolutely excellent. So why give that up? Don't give that up. We also never use it. So the fact that they're covering us with that insurance doesn't cost taxpayers anything. But should we need to suddenly spend time in Texas or anywhere in the United States and we have healthcare issues with our children, they would be covered without us having to put additional thought or work into it. That's important to us even though we don't foresee that happening. That's the purpose of insurance. If you could foresee it, you wouldn't need insurance. It is now raining on me pretty hard, so we're going to move into a different position so at very least my media kit is not getting rained on while I do the video. All right, this position isn't too bad. I'm getting a little bit of rain, but the camera is not. So it is a GoPro. In theory, it can go underwater, but it's got a media kit on it, so its doors are open, so it can't. Uh, that's in case anyone's wondering. Also, my lapel mic, that is a road. It is not meant to go underwater, but it certainly can get dripped on. I just need to be a little bit care careful. But I'm getting a little bit of rain. It is such a gorgeous day. I can't say. I love rain in general, and it's only been raining for a few weeks here. The summer is just ending. We're going into the, the rainy monsoon season. And yes, there are true monsoons here. I did research that. Uh, and uh, I, it, it takes pretty much the entire season before I'm not continuously excited every time it rains. 
I love the rain. Okay, so when you're looking at moving to Nicaragua, of course, you need to know what your insurance situation is back home. And only you know how much time you're gonna spend back home and how it's gonna make sense to handle that. Nice. <laughs> I actually like thunder and lightning as well as the rain, so storms are perfect for me. Uh, so if, you, if you're gonna be traveling back to your home country, you're gonna wanna keep insurance or whatever there that you need to be able to get continuous healthcare when you're home. That goes without saying, and I can't really speak to that other than consider the option, I'm getting a little bit too wet, uh, the option that you may want to look at traveler insurance if you're only gonna be back home a very small amount of time. And this is what, if we were gonna do something that we would do, uh, in the near future is, is simply get insurance that only covers us for a small amount of time and is designed to get us through critical issues and if something happens they would then fly us to a place or we would fly one way or another to a place that makes sense for us to remain. We wouldn't want to remain in the United States for healthcare. It is the worst possible place to be getting healthcare in an emergency. So our primary goal is to not die, followed directly by get out of the country at all costs. That's important to understand. The thing you don't want is your healthcare to happen in the United States. It's the lowest quality care and the highest cost care. And the higher it costs, the harder it is for you to get access to the care you need, even if it exists. So that combination is super dangerous. When you're in Nicaragua, this is where it really matters. This is where the, the expertise really comes in. This is what you're really wondering about. And also, just for, for note, for those watching the GoPro, I do have the EV cranked up by one stop just because it's a little bit dark and I'm in the shadow. So in case anyone's wondering why it looks a little bit brighter while it's a deep, dark rain, that is why. So when you're in Nicaragua, as a tourist, you do not require insurance. Insurance is completely optional. And keep in mind that, of course, as an option, you can simply go get traveler's insurance, no problem. If you need to pay out of pocket, healthcare is widely available and super cheap. And importantly, it is almost always cheaper than your insurance somewhere else. Let me repeat that, paying out of pocket for an event is almost guaranteed to be cheaper than your insurance from, say, the US. That changes everything about how you think about healthcare. In the United States, especially, we have to think about healthcare in a, if I don't have insurance, I could end up with an impossibly high medical bill that I could never pay in a lifetime. That is a very real risk. That is, that is how the healthcare system works, and it is part of a cyclical mechanism to guarantee that you must have insurance, and that the healthcare gets more expensive, and the system makes money by privately withholding healthcare and racketing up the cost through a mechanism that forces you to pay even when you're healthy, and doesn't have any means for you to shop around, so there's no way for you to keep the cost down in any meaningful way. You are trapped in a system that the government mandates must exist and you must participate in, and you don't have the right to take care of your own health care to escape from the system without leaving the country. I'm not gonna get into the politics of that, and it's certainly not partisan. It is simply how the US does that at a long-term government level and always has, or essentially always has. But that mindset, those factors don't exist in most other places. So when you're looking at healthcare other places, wow, you have to remember that the way you think about healthcare needs to change. Even having a heart attack or cancer does not imply that you're going to be in financial straits. You should be able to pay out of pocket for all of your treatments all of the time. That is how other countries work. They assume that healthcare needs to be affordable to a point where you can always pay for it. It doesn't mean it's not expensive, but in the United States, our health insurance is so expensive so much of the time that, that it makes it seem like we could never afford our own health care if we had to pay for it. But of course, all of that health care is paid for by the insurance. So one way or another, because of the laws of insurance, because the way insurance has to work, health care costs less than it does when you have insurance. Insurance does have a place. It is meant to spread out risk among society. It's not really how it works in the US, but it's how it's meant to work. And so the theory of it can make sense, but the reality of it is misleading in this case. So. For example, I'm going to use this. We have a video where we dived into this. We had a situation where we believed someone here had a heart attack. We had an ambulance trip to the hospital. Six doctors were involved. 
a day in the hospital. Now, this wasn't a long-term thing. This was not open-heart surgery. Of course, those things would be wildly more expensive. But all of those costs together came up to $185, including the trip to the pharmacy to get medicine. That's everything. The ambulance, the hospital stay, the cost of the doctors, the medicine, all of it. Under $200. In the United States, every single piece of that would have been way more than 200. The ambulance alone would easily have been $6,000. So you can see how things are much different. Had we had insurance to cover that event, and that was the only event that had that month, it still would not make sense because the insurance would cost more than a believed to be heart attack event. Insurance only really makes sense when it protects you from the unknown, and yes, you pay a little bit more, but to reduce risk. In the case in other places outside the US, generally what you end up with insurance is paying too much, so your money goes to an insurer, you no longer have that money, and when something happens, you have to depend on the insurer to still be solvent and to actually pay your bills and for the facilities that you're working with to accept that payment. They generally will, but they will not necessarily, or it may not be recognized at the time you need to go to the hospital. If you want to protect yourself in the best way possible, for almost all cases, the situation is best when you self-insure, meaning take the payment you would make to an insurance agency, but instead put that away for a rainy day and make sure it is an account you can never touch or don't ever touch. It all depends on your ability to keep yourself from touching it. But make an account that you will never touch. Put that money into an investment account that is incredibly conservative, such as an index fund, but one that you have access to whenever it's absolutely needed. Put that money away and make it a savings account. Over time, you will not only save up more money than you could ever possibly need for your health care, but you will also have that money in case you never need it for your health care. Let's say you're getting $200 a month and that's what you put away for insurance. After one year of not needing any healthcare or paying out of pocket for what little healthcare you need and banking the 200 every month, you would have $2,400 put away. That is an insanely a large amount for a healthcare concern to happen in most countries, but it's still wise to have access to that. It's also good if you have a credit card just in case you need access to a, a balloon amount of funds very quickly that you can't predict. Always great to have that little bit of extra insurance standing by. Also, make some plans around your healthcare. Make sure you have a doctor ready to go. Make sure you have your hospital picked out. Do that stuff. Do things to, to reduce your potential cost. Have people know your, uh, your allergies, know your history, have all that stuff ready to go. There's things you can do to manage your health, of course. By putting away that money, in the first year you have $2,400. After a decade of no major incidences, you'd have $24,000. Except you're using an index fund. So that money is accruing interest and reinvesting as you go. So by the end, of a decade or shortly thereafter, you could be much closer to $40,000 in cash sitting in an account. The chances that you will ever need to spend that for your health care is extremely low. Chances are once or twice throughout your lifetime, something will happen and you will need to tap it. But tapping it and depleting it are very different things. Needing to pull $3,000 out of a $40,000 account you really won't notice very much, but it'll keep you from having to pay $3,000 that you weren't intending to at some point in your life. That is a lot of healthcare, even major concerns like cancer. People, remember, people living in Nicaragua have a total income average of only a few hundred dollars a year. So their health insurance costs, whatever, the, the national health insurance that's covering them is coming out of that amount of money. So putting away more money per month into a savings account, into an index fund or something similar, that's going to accrue interest that is equal to or greater than the minimum wage of the country for people who have all their health care covered for that amount of money is an insane amount of money for the environment. This gives you huge buying power. It gives you the power to fly to any country that you need to get the health care you need. It gives you the power to demand second opinions. It gives you the power to be first in line for every treatment. It gives you the power to do anything you need and to have absolute control of your health care. And that's just after the first decade. If you start doing this early, every decade, you're gonna put in an additional $24,000, and the total amount of money that you have from the start of that decade until the end will roughly double, because that's about how it works on roughly a decade level in a full investment index fund. It varies, but basically always works that way, even during the Great Depression. Even if you did that the worst possible time, you barely miss these statistics. 
So this is health insurance as investing is kind of a thing that just makes sense and you need to consider. Now, of course, if you also have retirement funds that are accessible in the same way, merge the two and just treat it as a merged healthcare retirement. That's fine too. It all comes down to how you can mentally approach the situation. Don't put yourself in a position where you're gonna think, ah, I have all this money for retirement, I'm gonna take it out, I'm gonna buy a house, and then realize you just took your healthcare money and spent that on a house, and now you don't have any buffer for healthcare, don't do that, right? But with a little bit of planning and a little bit of statistics and a little bit of uh, risk management, and remember, I come from a Wall Street risk management background, so doing this stuff is exactly what I'm trained to do. Right? Insurance is a high risk endeavor. You only want it in situations where you could not overcome the risk on your own and the share, the overhead of having shared risk and the risks of a third party company holding the, you at ransom are things that are worth it because you could not bear the risk on your own. When you live inside the United States, that is both mandated legally that you have to and it is essentially a requirement because they've engineered the situation to make the risk impossible for a single individual to bear. When you're outside the United States, most places do not do that and certainly not Nicaragua. So the factors are flipped. Insurance po imposes a very large risk on you. Having the money at your disposal to do what you need to do makes you more powerful and more protected. And of course, you can do both. You can always get traveler's insurance. And I hate being someone who recommends not having insurance, and this is a very individual decision, but it's important to understand that the reasons we mentally feel compelled that insurance must be necessary is because most of us come from countries who have worked to create situations to make us believe that that would be true. Propaganda and, go check, the 2013 propaganda laws in the United States were changed to allow for this, Propaganda in the United States is designed to make you think that healthcare must be expensive and that places outside the United States do not have good healthcare. These are both false. Healthcare is generally very affordable worldwide and places outside the United States generally beat the United States in the final quality of care regardless of price. Putting those together, you have massive opportunity to live without insurance. And I had someone post while I was making this video, believe it or not, actually posted, but I'm really scared that I'm gonna get cancer or have a heart attack that's why I'm afraid of not having insurance or afraid of the overall insurance situation. And absolutely, that is the situation we're really talking about. If you get a cold and need to go to the doctor and have them just take a throat swab and say, ah, oh, you need this antibiotic, that's not what we worry about insurance for. I don't care who you are, you're not worried about that for insurance, right? That here will cost you about $10 if you feel the need to go to a doctor. And if you don't, you can go to a pharmacy and they'll probably give you what you need without needing to go to the doctor. And remember that medicine and the doctors are super cheap here. This is such a good rain and storm. So in most cases, uh, you don't worry about it at all. It's only these big events, heart attacks, cancer, and similar, that we really worry about needing to have insurance. Those are the unforeseen acute issues where we may need to be flown to an emergency treatment center in another country. That's a real possibility. But remember, these are small countries, so we use other countries the way that the United States uses other states. So you should not look at, oh, I had to fly to Mexico or Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, Colombia, as I had to leave the country, that's a terrible thing. If you were in the United States and had to be flown to Canada or Mexico or England for healthcare, that would be weird, because the United States is a massive market that has 50 individual sovereign states together. So if you need to fly to another state, you would think nothing really of it. Oh, I live in Buffalo, I had to go to Cleveland. That's fine, you wouldn't really need to because Buffalo has great healthcare. You might go to Rochester though, depending on the thing you're being treated for. Here in the region, we're exactly the same. If you're being treated for burns, you're gonna be coming here to Managua. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, Mexico, Panama, Colombia, this is where they're gonna send you. We're number one in burn handling. But if you're gonna have cancer, we're not the place to be. You're probably gonna get sent to Colombia. Everybody specializes in something different. And when it's something that doesn't have to be taken care of right that second, like a heart attack, it's smart that we have regional facilities that specialize in those things and have all the things that are needed in one place. And we all know where to go. Do that research ahead of time. We're looking at having doctor concierge services to make it even better. But that, that is how we use the system. The same way the United States does between states, we do between countries. Remember, for us to get to Mexico or Colombia is faster and closer than someone in Nebraska trying to get to, say, California or New York. It's far, but it's not U.S. far. It's not that bad. And remember, you also have the option of returning to the U.S. if you maintain healthcare uh, facilities in the U.S. The only thing you're worried about is acute care 
here, and if you want to have care in the United States, I have no idea why you would want to do that, but should you want to? Should that be something that you desire or are simply fearful of giving up? Which I understand, change is scary. These are the healthcare facilities you are accustomed to. You don't have to give them up. You simply need to be prepared and have enough money, which is not very much, for an emergency flight to the United States at a moment's notice and just realize you're gonna pay out of pocket for whatever acute care you need here. But if you suddenly find out you have cancer and you wanna be treated in the United States, they don't have to get you there in 12 hours. You can book a flight on Spirit, get up there for 150 bucks, go to wherever makes sense in the United States, stay, do whatever is sensible on both sides because you have time, it's not acute. Heart attacks are the thing that you really are trapped on. You're unconscious or a stroke. You're unconscious, you can't make any decisions. You need people to make good, affordable, life-saving decisions rapidly, and you have to wake up and know it's going to be taken care of, and that's what we try to prepare for. Hospital stays here are cheap. Doctors are cheap. Medicine is cheap. Ambulances are actually free. You have to pay a donation in order to fund them. Please give a donation. When, when, if you're an expat and you get taken by the ambulance, please give them at least a thousand cord. Right? It's like thirty dollars. Don't avoid. They have to pay for gas. They have to pay for those EMTs. Right? And it's all done by nonprofits. Please donate when they take you. That helps them pay for those trips. And if you can donate more, absolutely do so. For all of this, I don't want to say you shouldn't have insurance. This is a very personal decision. But be aware that in most cases, when you're looking at insurance and feel that you should have it, it is an emotional decision. You feel emotionally that insurance makes sense. It should be a mathematical decision. It's easy to say, well, what if? But when we do risk analysis, the what ifs are already included. If you say what if after doing a statistical analysis, that means you're double dipping. You've already included the heart attack risk in the statistics, but you say, but what if I get a heart attack? We already dealt with what if you had a heart attack. Now we're what ifing it twice, right? That's why in risk management, we don't say what if. We use what if to build the statistics. We don't use what if once we're considering the math. Given that that's an emotional decision, you need to, as best you can, look at the math and say, if these different events occurred, how would I be best taken care of? Would I be best served if I had insurance and I trusted them to take care of me? Or would I be best served if I had this money in the bank and I was in charge or my proxy was in charge of how to spend my funds, right? And it depends. If you get insurance, you're better protected in your first month. If you save up, you're definitely protected best after 20 years. And in between, you have to make decisions. For me and my family, we're on the young side of travelers. We're in our 40s, given our later 40s, but we've been saving for a while. We've done this for a long time. We maintain some insurance in the United States. We do not have insurance here. When you become residents here, you are required to get minimum insurance. So this is only something you look at during your tourist years, which could be forever for some of you, could be very short for others. If you're coming to Nicaragua, but plan on moving on to other countries, well, I'm gonna live in Nicaragua for these two years. I'm gonna put in two years in Brazil. Then South Africa is looking nice, right? If you're that person, then being insured probably doesn't make sense because you'll be able to always be a tourist and just keep saving as you go. But if you become a resident here, you're gonna be required to have insurance, which is not expensive. I don't know the exact number, but it is not expensive. And that will cover you for basic stuff in the country. You'll still wanna be setting money aside so you have power beyond what the insurer will do. Keep in mind, every insurer is different. How well they're actually going to cover you in case of an, an issue varies. In the United States, it is well known that insurance companies will often refuse to pay or refuse to give you necessary treatment. That's a major problem. You've been paying them and now your money is gone. You no longer have bargaining power short of a lawsuit. And trust me, you have no power in a lawsuit in the United States against a major company. So you are helpless when it comes to your health care. That feeling of abject panic we have when in the United States about our health care is caused by we have no money, we cannot afford the treatments, and we are not given any control over where the money we've already spent, which is huge numbers typically, could be used. We are at the mercy of the hospital, at the mercy of the doctor, at the mercy of clinics we don't even know exist, and at the mercy of an insurance company who absolutely hates us and makes their money best if we die. Having your money under your own control has value a lot of value that is hard to express. If you use an insurance company here instead of in the United States, my belief is that they're going to be better at actually providing healthcare because unlike in the United States, it is not a mandate. 
They do not have the legal right to your money. They are legally required to meet the, the level of insurance that they guarantee. And you can shop around. If they don't pay out, they risk people finding out and moving on to other insurers. So it's a competitive open market. This is a capitalist healthcare system when it comes to insurance. Here, you're used to a non-capitalist one in the United States. It is mandated by the government. It is actually a government insurance program. The fact that they are private third parties is a misnomer. They're actually acting as arms as the government. So it's very confusing to Americans moving abroad because propaganda in the US is so strongly based to convince you that there's an open market but that is anything but true. It is as far from an open market as it can reasonably be. Here, because you don't have to have insurance at all, it is purely an option and you can get it from anyone you want, even companies outside the country, ones that have never operated here before. It is a purely open market for healthcare in that regards. And so healthcare itself is never an open market. When you're unconscious going to a hospital, there's no such thing as capitalism. There's no such thing as a free market for unconscious on their deathbed buyers. Right, it goes against the concepts of shopping around, which are required for it to be capitalism and an open market. So it's important to also understand for those who are constantly being berated in the United States that, oh, it's all about being an open market. That is false. That is, the concept of health is not an open market. Anyone who says that is either trying to lie to you or has no idea what an open market means and it's just something they repeat because they want it to be true. They want this good thing to apply and explain away the horrors of the American healthcare system. But be ready, when it comes to actually a free market and you can do whatever you want to do, your options are very different and it's worth exploring them. Again, it's going to be a personal decision. You need to do the thing that makes you feel good, but you also need to do the thing that protects you. For me, the best protection for my family comes from not paying for insurance and instead setting that money aside for a rainy day. Anything that could happen, we can pay out of pocket trivially. It is not a big deal. If that factor changes when we become residents and we have to get insurance, we will obviously do so, but we will keep it at a minimum because we can still pay out of pocket for bigger issues. You need to evaluate this for you, your age, your health factors, many things will depend on it. One of the great things about having cash is that you cannot be turned down for prior conditions. You don't have to worry that someone finds out that you coughed three years ago, they claim that was a prior condition that you should have known about, and your health care is revoked. You cannot have your cash revoked after the fact. That's a big deal. People overlook how often insurance gets taken away from people or how often they don't get care because the insurer says, no, we don't think that that's the care. Even though the doctor said this is needed, we're not going to do it. Or in my own case, I've had the issue where the doctor said I needed something, the insurer agreed and said they would pay for it, and a third-party private company that was the only one legally allowed to supply the unit said, we're not going to work with your insurer or your doctor. You have to do these things that they say you can't do and that are not safe and violate health codes, but we're gonna require them because we don't have enough equipment and we're gonna make you ruled out automatically by putting requirements on you you can't meet and because they're not technically a healthcare company but simply a private company that controls your health, they're allowed to do anything they want. They have no mandate to function under the healthcare guidelines. Again, not a thing that happens here. You always have these protections outside the United States so many risks that you assume you have turn out to be simply American risks. So I ask you to really look deeply and say, am I looking at insurance from a perspective of something I actually need that is actually going to protect me, that is actually going to allow me to get healthcare that I need? Or is it fulfilling an emotionally incorrect, it could be emotional and correct, so that's, that it matches up is just nice. If it doesn't match up, if you have an emotional drive to get insurance, but you can't find a financial one, dig deep and try to decide, does it make sense to pay for insurance if that insurance harms you? Right? And in most cases, it does. The reason that we carry insurance on cars is because if you hit someone else, you could do an unlimited amount of damage to someone else and your ability or willingness to cover some third party should not be a factor in whether they get coverage. The, the important part of car insurance is covering other people, not yourself, and so it's different. 
So don't, don't think of that in any way in the same terms. That we may need to have car insurance all the time. Wholly different thing. Health insurance, life insurance, uh, business insurance, cyber insurance, these are traditional insurances and you should evaluate them. How likely are they to pay out? How likely are you to have an issue? If you did have an issue, what is the actual chances you wouldn't be able to pay for it? And how does paying an insurance company instead of banking that money change your power, change your ability to protect yourself long term? Same thing, I work in IT, cyber insurance is a scam. It is a full on scam and there's a whole industry of fake security companies who go around advising that people get insurance even though the, the numbers say it makes no sense whatsoever. They almost never pay out. When they do, they're often breaking the law. They put you at even bigger risk for being involved in uh, uh, hacking scams, in, in foreign funding, really bad things that you really don't want to do, both ethically and legally. And yet there's all these companies that suggest it because there's so much money in making false suggestions when that false suggestion includes funneling a bunch of money to another un unethical company. Yeah, it's crazy. So evaluate logically, use math, specific questions, get down below. I know there's gonna be a lot. I hope I covered enough to give you the basics of how you should be approaching it, how you should be thinking about it, all of that, because it, it really, it's all about the mindset. It's about really rethinking healthcare and insurance and er er removing the mindsets that we have in the United States and saying, okay, now I'm not gonna be in the United States. How should I approach it going forward? How should I approach it in Nicaragua? in Colombia, in Mexico, wherever I'm going, and apply that. And do I plan to move? Do I plan to stay? Do I plan to become a resident? How much savings do I have? What is my health care? All those things, put them together. It is a personal choice. But for eight out of 10 of you, somewhere around there, the answer should be not to have insurance unless you're told you have to. If you have the choice, you generally want to turn down insurance. Because, I have, I have episodes on this, having an insurance company means they are a for-profit company making profit off of the increases in the amount that people pay for their health care or whatever over what they pay out, right? That overhead has to come from somewhere and the only place it can come from is you, right? If they get hit with so many insurance claims that it goes above what they've collected, they fold and go out of business. They can walk away. That's the danger of insurers. They can take your money, put you at risk where you're dependent on them and they can either choose not to pay out or they can choose to go out of business. They are not going to choose to not make their profits and if you live in the United States, they're not legally allowed to prioritize you over their profits. The law says their profits are their legal responsibility, not your health care. So consider that as well. The way we think about things needs to change and it will open your eyes to Maybe you don't need insurance, or if you do, maybe that insurance doesn't need to be what you think it is. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I know you're gonna have questions. Again, please go down, say hi, say what you've done for insurance. How much are you paying out of country? How much are you paying in country? Um, what are your experiences? Have you ever been in a situation abroad where having insurance seems like it protected you? I'd love to do that math and see if that's actually true, right? We'll look and say, oh, you, you spent $100, $80 per month for that insurance. How long did you have it before the issue? How long did you go afterwards without? And like, let's do some math, right? This is my expertise. I do this for university studies and I have whole articles that I write for, for postgraduate where I show that using the numbers from the United States Department of Education and Department of Labor, that actually you lose money for every year you spend at university. Universities will say anything to make it seem the opposite, but the actual official numbers say you lose money. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it means you need to evaluate it based on real numbers so much propaganda from everywhere to sell us on things that don't benefit us individually, but are good for the populace at our individual expense. Consider those things carefully. Like and subscribe. If you want to support the channel and help me pay for the insurance I don't have, buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. If you'd like help or guidance in relocating to Nicaragua, if you're looking for healthcare concierge services, finding a house, just need a one-on-one -on -one chat online, whatever it is you need, shoot us an email, info at relocatenicaragua.com. We'd love to speak to you and see how we can help. A reminder that looking for houses takes a really long time. It is not a one day thing. Assume it's going to take weeks or a month, even to get a showing, even if we've selected a house that advertises for sale, it's going to take forever to get in there. And in half the time, they will refuse to even let us see the house, not film the house, see the house for real. We have no idea why it's like that. It is the market. 
that's why it's beneficial, but also a pain. Uh, and as always, share on social media, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.